Hello everybody, we are coming in for our one video that we're doing this week here. Um, it's not really a massive big video, but given what the ha what this week is including as a day, such as I know earlier in the week, I know it's a little late, but on Monday, if you did not know, it was officially Columbus Day, give or take whatever you want to classify it as, be it Columbus Day, be it Indigenous Peoples Day, be it whatever your preference. I understand that's kind of a hotly debated issue right now due to the, uh, uh, what happened to the Americas after Columbus came here, especially to the Native American peoples. That is definitely something that has caused a lot of conflict. But anyway, our video for this week, I wanted to just go ahead and kind of connect a little bit with Columbus Day, not by telling the history of Columbus Day and not by telling about Christopher Columbus, as I figure that you all probably know that. We all kind of know the old little thing that we were taught in elementary or little as little kids that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We all know that. We all know about the, the, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. We all know about that. What I wanted to cover in this video for this week is something that we call the Columbian Exchange. And this wasn't exactly happened with Columbus. It happened after Columbus, but it was something that was initiated by him coming over here. And of course, it bears his name because it basically started when he came over here. So they buried his name. So blah, blah, blah. So anyway, for this week's video, we're going to cover the Columbian Exchange. Now, the Columbian Exchange is basically, it's literally what it says. It's an exchange. An exchange of what exactly might be the question. And the answer would be, this was an exchange between the old world and the new. Or, if you want to simplify it, between Europe, which is the old world, and North and South America, which the Europeans have just found out about, or the new world. This is the exchange of things between these two continents. The exchange of animals, the exchange of plants, the exchange of diseases, which we're definitely going to have to talk about. And even people, to an extent. So this, the Columbian Exchange is what we give the official name of this little trade-off between the two continents that occurred after 1492, after Christopher Columbus came over here and sailed and landed on the island of San Salvador in 1492 in what is now the Bahamas. And he did that on October 12th of that year, if I think right. I think that's why we actually celebrate it on October 12th. But anyway, that was when this started and afterwards i think we all have been taught if we went through any high school history class or any middle school history class for that matter you probably got taught that after columbus came over here european nations went nuts they came over here thought they were going to colonize everything and sure enough they did especially and of course the very first big ones to do so were the spanish the one that had financed columbus's voyage and blah 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 and we'll cover exploration and colonization in the americas another day we're not going to focus on that today what we're focusing on is this. So w let's go ahead with the exchange here. And this really begins that due to all these nations that are coming over here to the Americas to explore and settle claims such as Portugal, Spain, France, Great Britain, or England, as we'll call it here, England. All these nations are coming over. They're sending explorers. They're sending colonists. They're sending merchant ships. They're sending troops to try to stake out claims and start colonies. Well, as they come over here, some of them do end up going back home. But while they were over here, they discovered these brand new plants, these brand new animals they'd never seen before because they were not native to Europe. They weren't native to Europe. They weren't native to Africa. They weren't even native to Asia. They were native to the Americas, and thus Europeans had never seen these kinds of plants. They'd never seen these kinds of animals. They'd never seen any of this. And of course, kind of like any curious human, they're, they thought, well, what if I bring this back home? What what benefits might I gain by bringing this back home? What money can I make? Because this is a new thing. And we didn't know quite quite know its capabilities or whatever it might be. Like a plant. You don't know, could that plant be used in medicine? Could it be something that you could use in food? Was there an animal here in the Americas that we could take as a pet? Was there an animal that was good to eat, to raise and slaughter? We didn't know, so bring them back home. While at the same time, the, the same thing's happening over here. As the Europeans are coming over, they're bringing along with their plant, their native things. They're bringing along plants. They're bringing along their own animals, such as cattle. There was no cows here in North America or South America. There was no such thing as cows until the Europeans came over here. There was no cattle. 
Native Americans, when they saw a cattle, I don't know, I don't even want to imagine what their first thought would have been, but like, what is that thing? It looks like a buffalo, but less shaggy and no horns. At least not regular horns. And why does that give milk? Of course, this would have gone for both both cultures. Both Europeans and Native Americans would have been shocked at the different kinds of animals and plants and stuff they were finding. And of course, there is a third hitchhiker here that comes along. And this was not one that was intentional by the Europeans, and it wasn't intentional by even the Native Americans either, because there was at least one disease that they did get from here. And we're going to discuss this little discrepancy here coming up. And that was the subject of disease. Just like anything... Where humans are, sickness follows, disease follows. And especially in the Europeans, they brought over all these diseases, and you're going to see what devastating impact that has on the Americas here very shortly. So let's go ahead and go through the categories, I guess, of what was brought over and what from Europe and what was brought over to Europe from the Americans. Let's just go over the different items of the exchange. So to really start out here, we're going to probably hit... The plants. Let's hit plants first. Now, the Europeans, this is, I will just want to keep in mind, this is not going to be the most excessively long video because we're mainly listing what did we discover over here in the Americas that they brought back to Europe and what did the Europeans bring over here to the Americas that they had not had over here. And nowadays, we don't think nothing of it. Europeans did introduce some crops to the Americas. They did introduce some plants. Mainly, they brought along their main crops that they were able to grow in the Old World, Africa, Europe, and maybe even Asia. And these were plants such as sugarcane, grapes, uh, wheat, barley, rice, rye, coffee, uh, lemons, cit other citrus fruits such as, orange, such as oranges or grapefruits, uh, bananas from Africa, actually. Watermelon was from Africa, too. They, remember, that not, not all of these were actually from Europe. Some of these were actually from Africa. Because the Europeans didn't know about Africa at that time. Of course they did. Uh, sorghum and cinnamon and ch cherries. They were all brought over here to the Americas. And even celery and coconuts were. Coconuts were not over here. And you would kind of think that's odd. You, you go down to the Bahamas or maybe to the Caribbean. Anywhere down there. And you might see a palm tree. You might see some coconuts. And you're like, wait a minute. Those aren't in Denver here. It is a tropical area. Well, it actually was not. Coconuts were not native to the Americas. Do excuse me. I just got an itch in my eye. The Europeans brought over these things. They brought most of your common fruit fruits that you would think about, apples, most of your common fruits and vegetables that you can think about were brought over here by the Europeans. I don't know what's going on. I feel like something stuck in my eye. Guess we'll find out. <laughs> anyway, the Europeans bring over this. Now, what do the Europeans bring back from the Americas? Well, they, from the Americas, the Europeans actually gain a lot from the Americas. They actually, they gain so much, it actually changes in some areas of Europe. Their entire culinary diets and recipes are changed. And you're going to see a very big, you're going to realize two big ones here that we are going to talk about. And the first one, well, not, yeah, let's go through the list first. What did the Europeans find here? Well, the main thing they found here was maize, also known as corn. There was no corn in Europe. That was native to the Americas. So the corn that we see here in the United States so commonly, Europe had no idea what corn was. The Native Americans knew what it was. They had been growing it for centuries. But, nope. Well, I take that back. Native Americans have been growing it for thousands of years. They've been technically here for a very, very long time. Anyway, they find corn over here. Pumpkins, which are very common right now due to its fall. I know it's the Halloween little season and you probably might be carving a jack-o'-lantern. I don't know. Pumpkins were found here, and so were other squashes, such as butternuts, acorn squash. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other squashes I can think of. I don't know if zucchini counts as one or not, but it might. Uh, peanuts were found over here. Pineapples. Apples were native to the old world, but not pineapples. Pineapples were native to the new world. Uh, cranberries were found here. Blueberries. Strawberries. Cashews. Uh, bell and chili peppers. Most most of all the peppers in the world were actually found here in the Americas. So just keep, take take that into a uh, little bit of consideration here for a moment. Prior to 1492, Europeans had not even known what a pepper was. 
There was no such thing as bell peppers or chili peppers. There was no such thing as banana peppers or jalapenos. There was no such thing as those. Most, if not all peppers, I could be wrong, but most of them, at least most, it could be all, are actually native to the Americas. So you got to think here. What I'm trying to stress here is think of the things... Odds are you're going to relate to the European culture because you're probably, um, you're probably in most cases, there might be a few people that might see this video, you're probably not Native American fully. You might have some heritage in you, but you probably have a lot of uh, traditional Anglo-European customs. Now, I'm not saying that. You might not. It, it, it ain't just that either. You could be uh, Hispanic, for instance, and that's still, you're going to have some European customs because you have influence from the Spanish who were from Europe. So, unless you're Native American or have some Native American cultural heritage that you still practice, you probably are going to be thinking along the lines of uh, an Anglo-European usual way or a Spanish-European thing. Anyway... I want you to imagine you're not going to have, you take peppers, like peppers for instance, you take these for granted today. Back then in Europe, they didn't know about this. They come over here and it's like, what is this tasty looking thing? Hot! My God, you got to try this. I'm not certain they did, but I. why do I get the bad feeling that some of these Europeans probably realized how hot some of these peppers were, and then just to pray, play a joke on their friends, they had their friends try and not tell them. <laughs> I can't imagine that. But anyway, let's go on with the list here. Uh, what are we, uh, vanilla was a major little uh, thing that they found over here, and a major ingredient that they found here that was native to the Americas. And look at vanilla now. We have vanilla ice cream, we have a bunch of little cookies with vanilla flavoring, we have vanilla frosting. Vanilla is mostly a flavoring, so it's also, it's very important if you're making cookies or cakes or any, almost any bakery item that there is. So they didn't have vanilla prior to this. That would suck. <laughs> there was no vanilla. The vanilla was native here, so they brought that back to Europe. Pecans were brought from the Americas. Papayas were found here in the Americas. Cotton, cocoa, Oh, yes, children. Chocolate is native to the Americas. Before 1492, European little children never knew a thing about candy. They had, well, they might have had some candy, but they had no idea how sweet candy could get. They had no idea what chocolate was. Well, and then actually to add this little part, the Native Americans didn't all the time know about chocolate f fully either. And you'll actually notice this as you go down to uh, Mexico, at least I've heard, it's still common today, not not specifically with their chocolate, though. But anyway, the Aztec Indians that lived in uh, what is now Mexico when these in about the time that Columbus came here, and in 1521 they were of course conquered by the Spanish and the conquistadores. The Aztecs did actually use the cocoa bean. The the cocoa bean is where the cocoa powder comes from. Now, cocoa powder on its own is actually bitter. It's not sweet. It's not, you're, you can't, like, don't, uh, I hate stuttering. Anyway, <laughs> chocolate today, you think of, when you think of chocolate and its taste, you probably think of it as being a sweet taste. Well, if you ever, probably, odds are you haven't, <laughs> but odds are, if you've ever had a little bit of an actual cocoa bean, or cocoa powder even, it's not a sweet powder, it's a little bitter. And the Aztecs, they did use the cocoa bean to make a very crude early version of hot chocolate. However, this hot chocolate was actually a little bit spicy and bitter. It was not the sweet marshmallowy concoction that you think of now. When the Europeans tried it, that's how they initially had chocolate, was in this spicy little bit of bitter form. And they initially, they liked it, but they didn't like it. They're like, how can we make this better? Because I don't, like, I don't like the bitterness. And soon they very much learn that if we simply combine cocoa powder with sugar and mix a bunch of other ingredients together and make it into bars, and this brown little substance of a bar, it's actually quite sweet when we add some sugar, sugar cane into it. So the Europeans were able to finally make a official modern-day form of chocolate upon combining this new cocoa from the New World, from the Americas, with the sugar that they had known for thousands of years. Let's see. 
allspice, which is a spice you use in cooking, was also found here in the Americas. And avocados, if you like guacamole, I'm sure you're happy that you live here in the Americas. That's where they're native to. Uh, sweet potatoes as well were quite native here. And there's two others that we really have to kind of focus on. And there's two big... Uh, three, actually. We're going to cover three. The first one is tomatoes. Before coming over here to the Americas, Europeans had no idea about tomatoes. Tomatoes are endemic here to the Americas. So they were brought back from the Americas to Europe. And the thing I really want you to ponder is think, especially, let's think of the Mediterranean, of the Mediterranean cuisine, the countries like Italy, Spain, Greece, uh, Cyprus, I'm trying to think of any other, Malta, maybe Monaco if you're really looking that far. <laughs> anyway, let's think of these countries, Turkey. Although I don't really think Turkey has this, so anyway, let's focus mostly on Italy. Let's focus on Italian cuisine. And most odds are, when you think of Italian cuisine, you think of it has some kind of a tomato sauce. Be it pizza, be it lasagna, be it spaghetti, be it, you know, anything that you're thinking that's Italian, or calzones, anything. And you think of a tomato sauce, or ravioli, or whatever. <laughs> anyway, you think of it with tomato sauce. Well, imagine, before 1492, Europeans had no idea, they had never even seen a tomato. They didn't know what tomatoes were, they'd never even encountered one, so thus they didn't use them, they didn't have them. Well, here's my question, I really don't want to even imagine, but I can't even formulate an answer in my head. What would have Ita what would Mediterranean cuisine specifically what would Italian cuisine have been like before 1492 because they didn't have tomatoes? What did they eat? <laughs> because that's all they eat now is tomato sauce <laughs> with their noodles and everything else most of the time. I know that it might be a little biased, but most of the time when I see Italian food, it is that stuff. But it makes me wonder what did they use because nowadays tomato-based sauces are so prevalent in their cuisine that. You almost can't imagine a time when they didn't have that, but at one time they had to not have had that. But anyway, think of that. Think of Italian food without tomatoes. It, it, you can't imagine it. <laughs> so that's one big thing, because when they bring it back to Europe, as we just said, it in Italy and the rest of the Mediterranean, tomatoes have a very big cuisine impact. They very much change the diet of that of the countries in that region of Europe. There's also two other plants that we will need to kind of discuss here, and the next big one I probably want to do is potatoes. Potatoes were found here in the Americas. Specifically, they were found in South America in the Andes Mountains, where the Inca Indians were. Uh, think of the countries of Ecuador and Peru and Bolivia, and maybe even Colombia if you really want to look around there. Chile, Argentina. Think of those. So potatoes were found here in the Americas. Now, the Inca Indians didn't cook their potatoes that often. More often that they were more than just fine with eating a raw potato. They literally would just pull the thing out of the ground and start eating. They had no problem with eating a raw potato, which is not exactly unhealthy. You can't eat a raw potato. It is actually, sometimes they say it's actually healthier for you if you eat a raw. But the problem with people eating raw potatoes is the factor that if you eat a raw potato, they taste pretty nasty. They don't got a real good taste. The Europeans, of course, when the first time they tried a potato, they tried it like the Indians were eating it. They're like, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> and they're like, Bleh. that was putrid. But they realized the Indians have been living off this stuff for years, so it must have been having a nutritional value. And of course, the Europeans, they devised, well, how can we possibly make this better? Well, of course, it didn't take long before the Europeans kind of discovered that Hmm, if we simply heat the potatoes over a fire or something like that and cook them a little bit, they actually taste pretty good. So they bring the potatoes back to Europe, and potatoes have a major impact in Europe, and they actually replace some of the main crops, such as barley or wheat. And why was this? Well, because the potatoes are very hardy. They're a very hardy plant. They're a very hardy vegetable. And in Europe, keep in mind, Europe gets pretty cold during the winter, at least back then it did. And Europe had a lot of famines going around in its countries during the winter because they had ever-growing populations, but they were still had very limited growing seasons, and they couldn't always produce 
enough food for their people. Thus, in the winter, when winter would come, there would often be famines in many European countries, especially in northern Europe, like Ger what is now Germany, which at the time was not Germany. It was like Prussia and Bavaria and a bunch of other German states, uh, France, England, Ireland, Scotland. These had famines going around in them because they couldn't produce enough food. Well, then they bring the potato over from the Americas, and it's a game changer. Because potatoes, A, they can withstand the cold temperatures of Europe. They are very hardy. They can withstand the cold temperatures. They have excellent nutrition. You could actually live off potatoes if you really wanted to. And they can even be left in the ground for weeks, which was a big advantage because Europeans, they mostly at this time, their main game crops were barley, wheat, rice, rye. These were their main crops. Well, these crops, as soon as they are ripe and ready to be harvested, you got to harvest them, like, immediately. You can't wait. And the Europeans, they couldn't always get to the fields in time due to, like, bad weather, due to other complications that might happen. They didn't always have the time to get to the fields in time before these crops rapidly went spoiled and could not be used anymore. Potatoes can be left in the field for weeks after becoming ripe and still be good. You got time to collect these things, which also saves time. Of course, Northern Europe gets the most impact from the bringing of the potato over to Europe, specifically the country of Ireland. And that's also going to kind of come back to haunt Ireland in the rear end because in the 1800s, there was a fungus disease that cut ravages through the European, Northern European countrysides. And this fungus does not attack people. It attacks the potato plant. And it kills the potato plants. They couldn't grow any potatoes. Well, the Irish by the 1800s were so uh, dependent upon the potatoes for their diets that when it's, this fungus virus comes through and starts wiping out the potato plants, they literally start starving to death and having a, one of the biggest famine that they ever had, which we know as the Irish potato famine of the 1840s, which causes many of the Irish to die in Ireland due to the lack of potatoes, the lack of food, and causes many of them to actually flee Ireland, either to go to other countries in Europe, or a lot of them, up to over 2 million of them, actually fled to the United States as immigrants. But potatoes were a massive thing that did have a big impact. Out of all the plants, potatoes were probably one of the most... Uh, impacting that they brought over from the Americas. Now, there was one last plant that the Europeans brought over, and that was tobacco. Oh, yes, that wonderful nicotine. That wonderful tobacco. Wonderful. Which rots your teeth out, which causes cancer, causes people to die. It quickly... Be, uh, tobacco was native to here. Now, other cash crops were not. Other drugs were from... Europe or Asia or Africa, but tobacco was native to here to the Americas. It is native to the Americas. And tobacco, of course, they quickly realized you could smoke this stuff because the Indians were already smoking it. And the Europeans quickly kind of relished that we can get rich off this. This can be a cash crop like cotton or something. What's that? What? I take that back. Cotton was not a cash crop at that time, but we'll, we discussed that in one of our previous videos how that became a cash crop. But anyway. Tobacco quickly becomes a cash crop after the Europeans discovered here in the Americas, and of course, it becomes the most commonly used drug in the world within a matter of years. Within a matter of decades, it becomes the most widely used drug, and it still is today. And in a kind of ironic twist, if you weren't really want to think about it like this way, how the Europeans mostly ravaged the Americas with disease and killed many, many of the Native Americans due to the diseases— this might be a little going off the limb here thinking about it, but you can kind of think about it as this. Think how many people die every year from tobacco, from smoking, from cancer, from infections or in their mouth or their lungs or whatever caused by tobacco smoking or tobacco chewing or whatever. Think of all the people that have died from tobacco usage. Well, if you really want to think about it, all the people that the... Uh, Europeans killed by coming over here and bringing their diseases and killing off the Native Americans. Well, you can kind of see it that the that the Americas kind of had their revenge because, okay, you killed my people. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you something that's going to kill your people. What is it? Oh, here, it's a drug. <laughs> Tobacco, in a way, was America's revenge for the diseases that had wiped out its Native population. So Europe brings disease to kill. America strikes back by sending a very, very commonly used drug. <laughs> 
So that ends our little plant category. Now let's go on to animals, which is probably one of our smaller categories. Now the Americas and its native peoples, they didn't have many domesticated animals. There wasn't there was domesticated animals of all kinds in Europe and the old world, such as Asia, Africa, Europe, all that. The Indians or Native Americans, they didn't really have domesticated animals. They didn't have pets. They didn't have farm animals. And this actually came as quite a shock to the Europeans because the Europeans kind of realized this and they're like, one big thing that was really shocking to them is the Native Americans were able to farm without using animals. Where in Europe, more often they used horses, they used cows. And they're like, how do you do this without animals? How do you do this? It came as a shock to them. The Europeans were primarily the introducers of domestic animals onto the American continent, such as they introduced cows, sheep, cats, chickens, pigs, geese, uh, goats, domesticated goats. There were some. There was the wild mountain goat that was here in the Americas, but I mean, dom these were domesticated animals. Donkeys, uh, domesticated honeybees. Honeybees were brought over here to the Americas, and then, of course, the big one that they brought over was horses. Horses had a major impact with the Native Americans because soon the Native Americans had kind of came to adopt horses of their own from the Europeans by bartering with them, by trading. And they it radically changed the way that the Indians were able to travel. It changed the way that they were able to hunt, specifically when they hunted buffalo because beforehand – the Native Americans' way of hunting buffalo in the Great Plains was to chase the huge herd off a cliff and get the ones that fell off the cliff and died. But they had to chase them on foot. Now they got these horses that can run even faster than they could, and they can literally spear the buffalo with the uh, while riding on the back of the horse. So it definitely changes the way that Native Americans were able to hunt, the way that they were able to live, the, the bringing over and introduction of the horse. The Europeans, in turn, they largely introduced a lot of the animals to the Americas. However, they did the Americas did have a couple of animals that were brand new that were of interest to Europeans that the Europeans brought back to Europe. And among these, they had llamas. Llamas were native here to the Americas. Guinea pigs, which were a domesticated little pet now. <laughs> Alpacas. Parrots. All parrots are native to the New World. There's no parrots in the Old World in Africa. There's not even parrots in Africa. So all parrots are native here. Uh, Muscovy ducks, which are a very fancy looking duck if you ever want to look up a picture. And of course, how could we ever forget? The Europeans for years have been dining on geese. They've been dining on goose for Christmas. Until they came over here, there was no such thing as a turkey. Well, guess what they found when they came over here to the Americas? They found the wonderful big Thanksgiving bird. Of course, that time Thanksgiving was not a thing. The Christmas ones. So turkeys. Turkeys were native here to the Americas. And of course the Europeans quickly realized these things taste good. <laughs> In fact, I don't think there was a thing they found that didn't taste good. Now we get to the big one that we really, really we're going to look at here. And this, the Columbian Exchange was mainly a trade-off of plants and animals and even people to an extent. But this was intentional. The one that was not intentional was also happened to be the most devastating and most impacting on the continent, on North and South American continents, and that was the factor of disease. Disease came with the explorers, whether they liked knowingly knew it or not, and it hitched rides on ships, it hitched rides on rats, it hitched rides on the explorers themselves, and these diseases had a devastating toll on the native populations. Why did it have a devastating toll? Well, because these diseases were not native to the Americas. They had never been in the New World. The Native Americans had lived for thousands of years here. They had never had any exposure or any kind of experience with these viruses, with these sicknesses and disease. These disease their immune systems had no defense at all against these new viruses. And it wasn't just one or two. It was like a whole herd of virus and disease. Of course. This ends up being quite devastating to the Native American populations because since they have absolutely no immunity, they end up dying from them, like, massively. Like, it wipes out many of the, many of the Native American populations get entirely or almost wiped out by, disease, by European diseases. 
Now, why were the Europeans not getting sick? Well, think, the Europeans brought these over. They've lived with these diseases for thousands of years. Their immune systems, although they can still get sick from them, their immune systems are used to fighting these diseases. They've had experience fighting these diseases. These are diseases that their bodies have encountered before. Where in the New World, these are entirely foreign enemies that had never even been on this continent. How could any of the native peoples have any kind of defense? So, what exactly did they bring? The Europeans brought the most, and here's what the Europeans brought. All these diseases come from the Old World, which means they come from Europe, or Africa, or Asia. They brought smallpox, was probably the biggest killer. Of course, smallpox is eradicated today. Smallpox was definitely one of the biggest killers in Native Americans. It definitely killed probably the most. You had smallpox, you had mumps was brought here, measles, cholera, chickenpox, malaria, yellow fever, typhus, diphtheria, bubonic plague, tuberculosis, rubella, influenza, or also known as the flu, whooping cough, also known as pertussis, and scarlet fever. And there was, of course, many more, but these are like the primary big ones that the Europeans bring over that just devastates the Native American populations. And what would commonly happen is there would be epidemics. And one, there'd be an epidemic of smallpox, some of the population would die, then that would be over, and then it wouldn't even be, before the year's up, you could have another epidemic of uh, flu, or tuberculosis, or cholera. It just wiped out the native populations, because they had absolutely no immunity to these diseases. Now, the New World, from what we know, didn't have a whole lot of diseases that the Europeans brought back to Europe. However, there are at least only three that we can possibly pinpoint as actually having come from the Americas. And the only three that we might have possible that the Europeans brought back was Pinta, which was like a rash. It was like a skin rash that you could get. It was very common down in Central America, what is now Central America. So the explorers, of course, would bring that back. Uh, Chagas disease, which is a caused by a parasite. And then the biggest one that probably had the most impact out of the ones that come from the, out of the three diseases that the American Americas gave compared to the hundreds of European diseases, out of the three that the Americas gave, there was one that kind of had a bad impact for Europe, and that was the introduction of cephalus. Which, I don't know if you realize this, but you want to know how cephalus is transmitted? It is transmitted through, uh, okay, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's transmitted through sex. It is a sexually transmitted disease. So, that also tells us that some of these explorers were getting quite intimate with the ladies. The Native American women over here. They were getting quite intimate with these Native American women. And then they were going back home, not knowing that they had, in the course of doing so... They had contracted a disease that was not exactly fatal. It wasn't fatal, but it was definitely something that lowered the fertility rate in many European nations. So, and of course, no European nation actually knew where this come from. So they blamed on each other. Like one called it the, Fran the French disease, another called it the Russian disease, whatever. Not ever realizing that this disease had likely come from the Americas. So the disease was definitely the major impactor. And just to kind of demonstrate here, by the 1600s, let's fast forward here. As Columbus dis well, discovers, I should say rediscovers, he comes over here to the Americas in 1492. The colonization begins there. By the 1600s, roughly 200 years later, the Native American populations in, the, in North and South America have fallen and it's estimated anywhere between 50 to 95 percent of their 1492 levels yeah and this was mostly due to disease in the caribbean it was mo it was mo it was the most devastating the european diseases were the most devastating to native americans in the caribbean in the caribbean islands area in fact two of the main caribbean native american peoples that lived on the islands there such as the taino and the carib peoples in the Carib, fun fact, the Carib are actually who the is is actually the Native American tribe group that the Caribbean gets its name from, and they were actually cannibals. The Taino were the ones that Columbus met when he landed. But anyway, these two tribe groups, which were the biggest here in the Caribbean, they were actually entirely wiped out by European diseases. They were rendered extinct because of this. They have no descendants today. And 
because of the disease, that brings us to our fourth and final little trade-off that happens between the old world and the new with the Columbian Exchange. And this comes in the form of people, and this mostly comes about because of the diseases. Now, you might ask, well, how does this help? Well, it's mostly a one-sided affair in this case. Europe didn't really gain anything except it sent people over here. It was America that mostly got a change in people. With the massive loss of the Native American populations, there's a lot less natives here in the Americas, which is clearing a lot of the land up for Europeans to just go ahead and snatch. And of course, what does European nations do? They send colonists over here to settle. So basically what we're saying is you're having a trade-off of here in the North and South America, you're having a trade-off of the native peoples. They're dying off or they're being hunted or they're being killed. They're dying out, and then in their place, to take their place, you got these newly arriving Ang European settlers that are coming over here and kind of filling in that void. So the change of people is basically the change from a mainly continental-wide population of native peoples to a continental-wide population of European settlers, is what we're basically saying. And the only benefit Europe really got from this was it did kind of free up space in Europe because we have all these people that are now leaving Europe, so Europe's becoming a le lot less crowded, which then allows the populations in Europe to grow as well since they are no longer facing overcrowding and populations are growing in Europe and populations are going up in the Americas on the European side at least. So that is kind of the gist here of the of the Columbian Exchange. It was just a simple little trade-off of different things that happened after Christopher Columbus came here. I thought it was worth mentioning this week due to the fact that it was Columbus Day this week. So I just wanted to go ahead and cover that for a little video for this week since I really didn't have much else idea. So that about sums it up for that. Now, our next two videos, we're going to have, I've been limiting it down to one a week because things have been quite busy, and I think it's going to be that way still for a little while. So, we will come back next week with our next video, and for our final two videos of this month of October, I am going to do two Halloween kind of themed videos, like, one will be based off a scary incident, and another just the history of Halloween, as I mentioned in one of our previous, so next week, our video will be on... I don't, I'm sure you give or take whether or not you believe in paranormal stuff or not. Um, I'm sure you've all seen or at least heard of the film of The Exorcist. We will be doing a video on the actual exorcism that took place of a young boy in 1949. That is supposedly one of the worst exorcisms that ever occurred in the history of, in the, well, in documented history. And it was this exorcism that supposedly served as the inspiration for the novel The Exorcist, which eventually got adapted into the film version in 1973. So we're going to cover the original Exorcist exorcism next week, what the history of this whole little supernatural event was. So we're going to cover that next week as a kind of a, just a little creepy little video, but it's still historical and oriented. So we're going to cover that one next week, and then the week of Halloween, we will do a little history video of Halloween in general, or as it started out, it was called Samhain, which was an Irish Gaelic festival in what is now Ireland by the Gaelic peoples. So we will discuss where Halloween comes from, where, do, where does the whole tradition of Halloween and jack-o'-lanterns and all this stuff, where does it originate, where, why do we celebrate it, why do we have it? So I just want, we're going to touch up on that on the week of Halloween, and next week will be the exorcism, exorcist video. So that is what we're going to do here for the rest of the month. So that if, of course, if anyone does give an idea I, at any point, even in these two weeks, I'm still willing to do it. If I find the time, I will definitely do it. If not, feel free to still put an idea if you have one, because we will get to it at some point. So don't let that be a determinant. If you have an idea and you feel that you want me to do a video on it, don't don't let that be a deterrent not to tell me you are more than welcome to go ahead and post something on there and I will get to it when I can. So again, any ideas, send them. If not, it's okay. Uh, I think that's all for this video. So yeah, so... I think we're going to go ahead here, and that should be wrapped up for today. So hopefully everyone has a good rest of their week, and we shall hopefully see you all back here next week for the little exorcist creepy video paranormal stuff. <laughs>
So anyway, we'll see you back next week. Hopefully have a good week and may God bless you all.